Judges, just before the book of 1 Samuel. Now, to orient us briefly to the passage before us, you may recall that last time when we were in the book of Ruth, we heard how Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth returned to Naomi's hometown in Bethlehem after living 10 years in a foreign land. And when Naomi returns, you may remember, she returns bitter after suffering so much loss in Moab. Remember, her husband died, her two sons died, she was left bitter with just her daughter-in-law Ruth to come home again. But there were also hints of grace when Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. For one thing, they returned to the beginning of barley harvest, which is an indication that new beginnings are on the horizon. And for another, she didn't return alone. Remember, Ruth, her daughter-in-law, was with her. Even though she doesn't recognize her or really acknowledge her, she was still there. And now we hear in the passage before us how Ruth, her daughter-in-law, steps up when Naomi cannot help herself and acts as the conduit of grace in her life. So with that brief introduction in mind, hear now the word of the Lord, Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. She said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose woman, young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back from Naomi from the clan of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in, any, in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found so favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her and also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, and one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Well, when Lori and I um, got married 13 and a half years ago or so, um, there was a lot of planning, I remember, in the lead up to that big day, all of which was compressed into just a few months. 
Um, there was also a lot of setup that had to happen the day of our wedding, a lot of cleanup that had to take place after the wedding and reception were over. But this, of course, is not unique to our wedding because typically every wedding, you might know, involves all of those components. And it often proves to be a long and tedious and expensive process to pull off that one big day. But one of the wonderful things about being a young, starry-eyed, 23-year-old groom when I got married is that I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. <laughs> now, I may have had tasks here and there in the lead-up to our wedding, but Lori and her mom, they did all the planning. I may have given my opinion on certain items on the wedding cake, and I didn't even get my way, but um, I didn't have to execute any of my opinions. And at the end of the day, other people were responsible for setting up the venue, other people cooked all the food, another pastor prepared all the remarks, I wasn't a pastor at the time, and critically, another person wrote the check to make sure all that stuff happened. And I thank my father-in-law Tom for that. <clears throat> you see, at the end of the day, I had the easiest role of anyone else. I just showed up. I got to marry my bride, and everything else was covered. Now, whether or not you're married or your wedding experience was anything like mine, I think we all know how enjoyable it is when we don't have to stress about the hard work of pulling off a big event. Now, that's not to say that hard work can't be fun or rewarding, because it can be, but when we can just show up and know, know that all the work has already been done, everything the behind the scenes has already been accounted for and covered, and we can just enjoy the event or party with little to no responsibilities, that's a great gift to enjoy. And with that in mind, thank you, Fair Trade Team, for letting us enjoy that sale a few weeks ago here at the church. But while enjoying stuff like that with no responsibilities is one thing, I think many of us also know the reality of what it's like when we, in our desperation, can't do anything to help ourselves. And we need other people, even God himself, to show up and take care of all the stuff that we cannot take care of on our own. Now, perhaps you've been in a situation before where you're desperate, where you need other people to see your desperation, where you can't do anything to fix your desperation, and out of nowhere, the Lord meets you in his desperation, maybe by extending mercy to you through other people and grants you relief that you couldn't begin to imagine on your own. But far more significant than just showing up for a party and seeing all the work that's already done. In those instances, we can show up for life once again, knowing that we did nothing to contribute to our own relief. Rather, it was the Lord who saw us, the Lord who acted when we could not act for ourselves, and the Lord who proved to be our help when we could not help ourselves. Well, understand that this is essentially the situation we come to when we turn to our text. Remember, we've said in previous weeks that the main character of the book of Ruth is probably not ultimately Ruth. It's Naomi. And in the passage before us, we see how when a bitter and desperate widow can't do anything to help herself, how the Lord raises up a team consisting in Ruth and then in Boaz to ultimately meet her in her desperation and eventually restore some hope to this hopeless and bitter widow. So our big idea as we come to the text before us is this. The Lord is our help when we cannot help ourselves. The Lord is our help when we cannot help ourselves. And throughout this passage, we see the Lord's unexpected graciousness extending particularly to Naomi in three ways. First, we see a gracious initiative. Second, gracious provisions. And then third, gracious information. A gracious initiative, gracious provisions, and gracious information. So let's begin, gracious initiative. Now recall again, that when Naomi and Ruth re-entered life in Bethlehem, uh, Naomi did a few things. Remember, first she recoiled when she returned back to Bethlehem and she heard people of Bethlehem say her name, since Naomi, her name, meant pleasant. And after all the suffering she'd experienced, she felt a great mismatch between her name and her reality on the ground. And so she said back in chapter 1, verse 20, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, a name that means bitter for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And second, she also failed to acknowledge when she returned back to Bethlehem, Ruth. And she didn't recognize her at all in the midst of her suffering. It was as if Ruth wasn't even there. But it's so interesting that when chapter two opens, notice that Ruth isn't harboring any grudges about that oversight. If you've ever walked with someone who's suffering before, you probably know how easy it is to take things personally personally. 
to take personally the unpolished or harsh words that might be thrown like darts. But Ruth holds no animosity towards Naomi. Rather, the first words Ruth speaks in verse 2 are essentially a request for Naomi to let Ruth help her because Ruth recognizes that Naomi in her bitterness and suffering cannot help herself. And so Ruth asks in verse 2, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. Now there's a little bit of background here that we need to understand in order to make sense of Ruth's request. You see, in Israel's law, there were provisions that permitted people who were on the lowest rung of the social ladder to go out into the fields of fellow Israelites and get grain for free. On the one hand, landowners had a certain responsibility in Israel to leave certain, certain portions of the land untouched. Uh, there were certain portions of their field that they were, un, they were not permitted to harvest because it was designated for the poor in the land. And on the other hand, the poor of the land, including widows like Naomi and Ruth, well, they were permitted during harvest to go into the field and take grain that had fallen to the ground. Uh, they couldn't just take what they wanted, but they could follow after the reapers, the harvesters, and if the scraps fell to the ground, they could pick up those scraps and take them for themselves. That was permitted in the law. And so when Ruth asks Naomi to go out in the fields and glean, this is what she's asking Naomi for permission to do. And how does Naomi respond? Well, in Hebrew, she responds with just two words, go, my daughter. She doesn't thank Ruth for putting together a plan to feed them. She expresses no concern about her young widow daughter-in-law going to a new place all by herself. She doesn't provide any direction to steer Ruth to the right field. All she can muster is just two words. Understand that if anything is going to lift Naomi out of her despair, it's not going to be her. But in this critical moment, what do we find? Well, we find Ruth steps up as an extension of God's mercy to meet Naomi in her helplessness. Now, we'll talk a bit more about the second half of verse 3 in a moment. But as soon as Naomi grants permission that Ruth saw, what does Ruth do? Well, Ruth sets out and she begins to glean. Again, with no thank you and only the slightest of acknowledgments from Naomi. But friends, this is what love looks like sometimes, isn't it? You know, I think one of the best illustrations of this is parenting children, small children specifically. You know, parenting is often a thankless job, isn't it? Or can be. You know, for the most part, little kids are helpless. Depending on their age, of course, they can't make food on their own. You have to do that for them. When they get upset stomachs in the middle of the night and throw up, you have to go and clean everything up. Learned that this week. They can't do it themselves. And then you have to take them anywhere they need to go. They can't go to the doctors by themselves or really anywhere else. Now, of course, that's not to say that parenting isn't rewarding because it very much is. But when we think about what parenting looks like sometimes, well, perhaps we can understand what Ruth is doing in the passage before us. Now, to dive a bit deeper into this, there's a certain word that shows up a few times in the book of Ruth. It's a word we talked about a few weeks ago, and it's a word that's translated elsewhere, steadfast love. It's the word hesed, a word that showed up all over our call to worship text earlier in the service. And it's a word that first and foremost describes how God relates to his people. You know, this is how Sinclair Ferguson describes it. He writes that hesed refers to God's deep goodness expressed in his covenant commitment, his absolute loyalty, his obligating of himself to bring to fruition the blessings that he had promised, whatever it may cost him personally to do that. Again, this word hesed, steadfast love, is a word that first and foremost describes how God relates to his people. But in our passage, we see how God exercises steadfast love through people like Ruth, and then later through Boaz, both of whom go above and beyond the call of duty in a committed way to meet the needs of those who cannot help themselves. Now, shortly we'll talk about how both Ruth and Boaz, as extension of God's covenant love and mercy, point forward to the greater mercies that we have in Jesus Christ, the one who ultimately helped us when we could do nothing to help ourselves. But for now, in light of what we just read, ask yourself the question, as those who have received and benefited from God's covenant love in Christ, again, who helped us when we could not help ourselves, are there relationships where God might be calling you to step in right now and take the initiative for someone else who cannot help themselves? Again, we know how much of a relief it is when all we have to do is just show up and someone has already taken care of everything for us. But are there people in your life right now who need that? Ask yourself the question, where can I, as a recipient of God's gracious initiative in Jesus Christ, 
take the initiative for someone else. Now, this is what Ruth does for Naomi. She shows steadfast love to Naomi as an extension of God's mercy shown to her. But in what follows, we now meet this man named Boaz. And we see how he, in turn, shows steadfast love to Ruth, and by extension through Ruth, back to Naomi once again. So this leads to our second point, second gracious provisions. Now, as readers, we know at this point more than Naomi and Ruth know. Because back in verse 1, we were briefly introduced to this man named Boaz. We heard this, there's a guy named Boaz who existed. He was a relative of Elimelech, that's Naomi's late husband. And we heard, and now we hear, lo and behold, when we turn to the second half of verse 3, when we see that Ruth, well, Ruth just happens to stumble across a field that this guy, this relative named Boaz owns. Notice at the end of verse 3 how the text explains Ruth's movements after she sets out from Naomi's house. We read, and she happened, Ruth happened to come to that part of the field belonging to Boaz in verse 3. And actually the Hebrew text is even more suggestive than that. You know, one commentator translates the Hebrew text as, quote, the happenstance that happened to her was, you see, the way it's worded is a deliberate and ironic attempt to show that this is the hand of God directing Ruth's movements. Uh, one commentator, Daniel Block, puts it like this. He writes, the statement is ironical. Its purpose is to undermine purely rational explanation for human experiences and to refine the reader's understanding of providence. In reality, he's screaming, see the hand of God at work here. Again, as noble as Ruth proves herself to be in helping Naomi, when Naomi can't help herself, and as much as that should challenge us, everything that happens in what follows is being dictated and directed by the providential hand of God, which is great news, because Ruth, as low on the social ladder as she is, wouldn't have any success in just any random field in Bethlehem unless the Lord directed her steps in exactly the way that he's doing and so providentially, by the hand of God, Ruth shows up in this field belonging to Boaz, of all people, and it seems that she gets to work right away. Remember, she's taking advantage of that provision in God's law, in Israel's law, that allowed the poor and the outcast to glean in fields that were not their own, and that's what she does in the passage. And as she's gleaning in the field, well, who just happens to show up at the right time? Well, it's Boaz. And the first thing we hear about him should give us a little bit of relief. Because up until now, we've only heard that there was this man named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi, but we didn't know what kind of man he was, how, how his character would shape up. But now we learn that he's a man of high character. He's a man who greets his hired help when he comes on the job site. He doesn't scream at them, yell at them, or ignore, him, ignore them. And then he acknowledges the name of the Lord in a heartfelt way as he blesses his workers. And then at some point, Boaz notices Ruth gleaning in the fields, and he turns to his foreman and asks, who is she? Or more properly, whose is she? Is she single? Maybe there's some of that in Boaz's question. And the foreman proceeds to explain the backstory that we as the reader already know, and he highlights for us Ruth's persistence in the field. In verse 7, verse 7 is a notoriously hard verse to translate in Hebrew, uh, but the ESV seems to capture the essence of it well. Namely, that just as Ruth had shown persistence towards Naomi, now she's showing persistence in the fields of Bethlehem, gleaning virtually all day, apart from a few breaks. And Boaz is impressed by all this. He's impressed, first and foremost, by, Naomi's, or by Ruth's kindness to Naomi. And then in turn, when he begins to address Ruth, he, he, gives some, he, he, um, he extends some kindness and some generosity to Ruth herself. After the foreman explains everything to Boaz, he turns to Ruth, and first of all, he says, my daughter. He addresses her as my daughter. It's not a literal term, of course, but it is a term of affection, a term of commitment, and importantly, it's a term that cuts through the social barriers that would have naturally separated two people like this who were worlds apart. But again, isn't this what love does sometimes? Boaz then invites her to continue gleaning in his field, but he also has great concern for her safety, something that Naomi didn't share. For one thing, he instructs Ruth to remain close to his young women. Those would have been the, the hired women who were to help in the field of Boaz. And to do so would ensure her safety and would also probably yield a greater amount of grain since she's able to stay real close to the hired help, the hired women. And then for another thing, he assures her of his command that none of the young men are permitted to touch you. 
In fact, rather than the young men being a threat, Boaz invites Ruth to drink from whatever the young men draw. This is stunning, since Ruth, who's among the lowest in Israel's social hierarchy, isn't going to be served by those above her, rather, she, or she is going to be served by those above her, rather than being their servant. But Boaz's kindness doesn't end there, because he then invites her at mealtime to come and feast with him and his hired help. Now, keep in mind that to share a meal with someone in such a context was a significant expression of community. And Ruth as a foreigner being invited into this meal is also an invitation of sorts to become part of that community. Far from being thrown scraps here, Ruth is invited to feast and after she eats as much as she can, she still has food left over. Talk about a reversal of famine. And then to top it all off, Boaz instructs his young men when they return to the harvest in the evening hours to let Ruth glean even among the sheaves and even to pull out some grain from the bundles to leave on the ground for her. Understand that in several ways, Boaz here presents himself as being a man who goes above and beyond what the law commanded of landowners like him. And in the end, just as Ruth had shown covenant love to Naomi, what does Boaz do? Well, Boaz extends covenant love to Ruth. And yet all of this, all of this is ultimately rooted in the Lord's covenant love for his people. And Boaz seems to recognize this as well. When he says in verse 12 to Ruth, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, Boaz points out here that in relocating to Bethlehem with everything that entailed, Ruth had in essence taken shelter under the wings of the Lord. And he seems to recognize in that that his graciousness is only an extension of the Lord's gracious protection of his people. But Boaz's words here in, in verse 12, they're like the tip of an iceberg that remind us of some really important deep truths in the scriptures. First, understand that these are words that Boaz speak which look back in Israel's history. Specifically, they look back to how the Lord has already dealt with his people when they were wandering in a desert wasteland, in a land that was not their own. Moses in Deuteronomy 32, 10 through 11, reminded Israel when they were on the plains of Moab getting ready to press into the promised land of how the Lord protected them when they were in a foreign land, as it were. The Lord through Moses declared that the Lord found Israel, quote, in a desert land, in the howling waste of the wilderness. The Lord encircled Israel. He kept for him, or he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of an eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and flutters over its young, spreading its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him, and no foreign god was found in him. Those are the words that the Lord speaks over Israel when they were in desperation in the wilderness. And with that text in mind, Boaz sees Ruth, a foreigner, who's in a different kind of way outside the land of promise, as a subject of the Lord's gracious protection, just as Israel was at one point. But second, Boaz's words here, unbeknownst to him, also look forward in the history of the redemption, history of redemption to Jesus's words. Jesus's words that will be spoken over a thousand years later. You see, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus laments Israel's repeated rejection of God's servants, ultimately culminating in, in Israel's rejection of himself. And in the course of his lament over these realities, he echoes the words of Deuteronomy 32 that I read a moment ago. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Among other things, Jesus in that passage reminds us that he's the one who provides shelter for his people. He's the one who would take and has taken the initiative for his people in the most ultimate sort of way. And yet his people were not humble enough to submit themselves under his wings. And yet, what do we find of Ruth? Will we find someone who willingly and gladly submits herself to the God who graciously takes the initiative. You see, throughout her interaction with Boaz, even though she's shown incredible grace, she never elevates herself too high. Instead, she refers to herself as a foreigner in verse 10, and then as just a servant in verse 13. 
She submits herself in humility from start to finish. She never acts entitled. And in her submissiveness, the Lord meets her. He heaps grace and grace upon her through Boaz. You know, one of the questions that I think this leaves us with then is whether we have humbly submitted ourselves under the wings of Jesus Christ. Understand that every blessing Boaz heaps upon Ruth in our, pic- in our passage is just a picture of the blessings, the greater blessings that we receive in Christ. You know, one commentator, Daniel Block, puts it like this. He writes, from the first time Boaz opens his mouth until the last words he utters, his tone exudes compassion, grace, and generosity. In the man who speaks to this Moabite field worker, biblical hesed, but steadfast love, becomes flesh and dwells among humankind. Now, that might be a little bit too strong to ascribe to Boaz, but it is true that he foreshadows in himself the one who would come from his very own line, Jesus Christ. And more than Boaz, friends, Jesus Christ invites his people into a kind of intimacy that we do not deserve either. He invites us to dine at his table as outcasts, unfit to eat even the scraps that fall from his table. And yet in the fullness of time, the Lord made it possible for we who were not a people like Ruth to become God's people by taking shelter under the wings of the crucified and resurrected one. The question, though, again, is what is your posture before Jesus Christ? Is your posture that of an entitled and spoiled child who expects God to give you everything your heart is set upon? Or is your posture like Ruth, someone who sees yourself as you really are and then stands astonished by the grace of God and the gospel that's been lavished upon you and me? Again, we see in this passage the gracious providence of God in directing events to meet Ruth in her humility, and then the gracious provisions of God heaped upon Ruth in her helplessness. But even more than that, we see Jesus Christ in the scriptures as the yes and amen to all of the promises of God who heaps even greater blessing upon us as his people. And so how do you respond to that? Now, returning to our passage, we see that Ruth is extended an incredible amount of grace here by Boaz. But as the evening turns to night, Ruth returns home to Naomi, and she once again extends grace to Naomi through the gracious provisions she was extended by Boaz, and then the two exchange together some gracious information. So this leads to our third point, third gracious information. So when Ruth wraps up in the field this night, we learn that when all is said and done, she eventually gathers an ephah of barley. Now, for those of you who don't measure your groceries and EFAFs, um, I'm told that's anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds of grain, depending on a few factors. Uh, or as one commentator notes, it's, quote, the size of a colossal bag of dog food. Um, and as Ruth comes through the door and Naomi sees all the grain and then eats Ruth's leftovers from the feast that she just had with Boaz, she has more to say now than she did earlier. She has more to say than just two words in the wake of all this. In fact, she first rattles off two questions and then pronounces a blessing on Boaz before Ruth can explain anything. But once Ruth finally does explain things and then reveals this connection to Boaz, Naomi is even more elated. She blesses Boaz and then she acknowledges the hesed of the Lord, the covenant love of the Lord. Understand that this news that Ruth brings back to Naomi brings life and color back into Naomi's depleted and pale self. And now that she can finally see clearly she extends to Ruth an important piece of information herself. She informs Ruth that Boaz is actually one of their redeemers. So what does that mean? Well, understand that in the Old Testament, this term, a redeemer, a goel, is used to describe someone in the realm of family law who had certain responsibilities. You see, if you were an Israelite and you fell on hard times or you had a particular need, certain relatives were called to come to your aid. Uh, for example, if things got so bad in your life that you had to sell yourself into slavery, which would happen from time to time, a certain relative of yours was able to function as your redeemer to buy you out of slavery. Uh, this redeemer provision in the law applied to matters related to property, matters of justice, and even matters related to marriage. We'll get along to that one a little bit later in Ruth. So when Naomi identifies Ruth as their redeemer, we're being reminded, as well as they are, that there's someone the Lord has providentially placed in their lives to help. And now Naomi can begin to see clearly. And what follows, her motherly instincts kick in at last. 
She didn't seem all that concerned about Ruth's safety or well-being near the beginning of our passage, but now she reminds Ruth to stay with the young women in Boaz's field, lest she be taken advantage of and be assaulted in another field. She didn't see clearly enough to give Ruth that advice early on, but now, now, now her care is restored, information has been presented to her, and the gears, once at last, begin to turn. You know, Naomi's shift here sort of reminds me of those detective shows or films where that central piece of information, that that keystone that makes sense of all the other evidence is suddenly figured out by the detective. You know, although that the detective has his aha moment. And at that point, everything else begins to come together. The lights come on, the gears begin to turn, and there's nothing to stop the detective's momentum from figuring out the crime once and for all. Well, this is sort of what it's like with Naomi. Gracious provisions have been heaped upon her. Gracious information is relayed. And now at last, she's able to see clearly. And brothers and sisters, this is what happens to us when we experience the grace of the gospel too. You know, there's a term that theologians sometimes employ to get at the reality that apart from the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, our minds are darkened and clouded and unable to think rightly about God or about his world. The term is called the noetic effects of sin, from the Greek word nous, a word that means mind, the mind. And the Apostle Paul gets at this idea where he writes in 2 Corinthians 4.4 that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, none of that means, of course, that an unbeliever can't accomplish feats in this world, but it does mean that something will always be off, spiritually speaking, apart from the work of God in bringing us to new life. But when we experience that new life, when we experience the renewal of the Holy Spirit and we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, friends, it's like the keystone is set in place and everything else begins to come together too. Of course, that's not to say that we as Christians have all the answers or that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't actually reason according to our old nature rather than our new. But like Naomi, when we receive grace and the Spirit begins to grow the seed of the gospel in our hearts, there's a very real sense in which the lights come on, the gears start moving, and we begin to see the world and reason about the world in a very, very different way. The question then is twofold for us to consider. First, for those of you who, don't, who, who, who really don't know Christ, understand that according to the Bible, you're not walking in wisdom right now. You may be accomplished in life, you may be super intelligent, but the Bible's evaluation of you is that your mind is, spiritually speaking, darkened and hardened, and the only way to lift that fog of unclarity is to submit yourself to Christ, entrust yourself to his grace, and let the word of Christ renew your mind. But then second, for the rest of us, we still have a responsibility as it relates to this, Because we're called, in the words of Paul, to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This means that we continue, as we continue to hear the word of Christ speak into our lives, that we continue to humble ourselves under it. That we continue to be open and even eager to let it shape those parts of our lives that maybe haven't been brought into conformity under the authority of Jesus. Again, the word functions for us like it did Naomi. It's the keystone, something that the Spirit uses to turn the lights on and enlighten the eyes of our hearts. We're invited, just like Naomi did, to begin thinking outside of ourselves when the Spirit, in fact, does that. And as Naomi begins to do here, then we can begin to make the concerns of other people in our lives, in our church family, our concerns too. And so with that in mind, as we wrap up and prepare ourselves to feast at the Lord's table, Let me encourage each of us to come to terms with our own weaknesses, to come to terms with our own weaknesses. You know, whenever the elders meet with uh, prospective new members, one of the things we emphasize about church membership is that it's a recognition that we as Christians can't do life on our own. We need each other because where I'm weak, someone else might be strong, and where someone else is weak, well, maybe I'm strong. And we see this in our passage too with Ruth, don't we? Ruth is strong where Naomi's weak, and as such, she's able to bring life back into Naomi's life. But Ruth also needs help where she's weak, and that's where Boaz steps in. This is, I think, a striking picture of the kind of dynamic we're invited into in the church as well. And to operate in that way requires that we recognize when and how we're weak and where we need help. But ultimately, beyond how we relate to each other, each of us are called to humble ourselves 
under the mighty hand of God and come to terms, if we haven't already, with our weakness before the face of God. Understand that in our sin, we are as desperate and weak as Naomi was after she arrived in Bethlehem. And apart from the grace of God meeting us like it did Naomi and Ruth, well, we would starve, spiritually speaking, because we would, like Naomi, be paralyzed from even moving. But thanks be to God that in our weaknesses, God has met us. God has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. And friends, God feeds us by his word and spirit and sacraments right now as we come to him, acknowledging our weaknesses, but resting upon his grace. Let's continue to do that. And if you would, pray with me. Father, we give you thanks that you have taken the initiative in our discipleship when we could not. Father, you have met us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You have fed us by word and sacrament. And we pray that as we prepare to come to this table and taste and see that you are good, that you would continue to re renew us in the truth of the gospel. You would continue to nourish us in these gospel realities that while we could not do anything to come to you, you gave up yourself gave us your spirit that we might taste and see for all eternity that you are good. I pray that you would assure us of these realities as we prepare to come to your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.